As soon as the American colonies declared their independence, they sought for help in their war against Britain. <clears throat> Benjamin Franklin was dispatched to Paris in hopes of gaining an audience with King Louis XVI and receiving aid for the United States from France. Franklin was successful following the Battle of Saratoga, and Louis XVI sent ships and troops to battle against his longtime enemy. This painting from the Chateau of Versailles shows the Battle of Yorktown, the decisive last battle of the American Revolution, where George Washington and General Rochambeau of France co-command a large ground force, defeating General Cornwallis. After the victory, France remained very interested in its new young ally and in the form of government it would develop. The Constitutional Convention, presided over by George Washington, formed a new rationally based government based upon universal principles. James Madison, seeking to gain public approval of the new Constitution, authored the Federalist Papers, which reflected this confidence in the rational. Paper 51 says, in part, Ambition must be made to counteract ambition. The interest of the man must be connected with the constitutional rights of the place. It may be a reflection on human nature that such devices should be necessary to control the abuses of government. But what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. A dependence on the people is, no doubt, the primary control on the government, but experience has taught mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions. This newly formed government of the people, this rational rule, was keenly noticed by the French who helped fight in the Revolution. Not long after the ratification of the Constitution, things in France took a decided turn for the worse. The winter of 1788-1789 was extraordinarily harsh. Crop failures and hunger were the order of the day. This picture shows Louis XVI distributing alms to the poor of the city of Versailles. Not even the seat of government was exempt from the economic hardship. The poor crops, coupled with the large national debt incurred while fighting in the American Revolution, brought the kingdom to the brink of financial ruin. Desperate times called for desperate measures, and so Louis convened the General Estates, a sort of national deliberative body, one which had not been convened since before the reign of Louis XIII in 1610. The General Estates consisted of representatives from the three tiers of French society, the clergy, the nobility, and the common folk. From the outset, the members of the Third Estate wanted a larger say. There were almost as many of them as there were of the other two groups combined. Why should their votes count for only a third? On June 17th, the members of the Third Estate declared that since they represented a majority of the population, that this was now to be considered a national assembly. Such talk of sharing power upset Louis XVI, so he locked the doors of the assembly hall and declared it adjourned. On June 20th, the members met in an unused indoor tennis court and declared themselves the National Assembly with power to draft a constitution. All there swore an oath to this form of government. Jacques-Louis David, one of the delegates, painted then this moment in his tennis court oath. Emboldened by this move, crowds in Paris took action on their own. On July 14, 1789, an armed mob stormed the Bastille, the old royal prison in central Paris. While there were hardly any prisoners there, there were guns and ammunition, and it was more than simply a symbolic storming of a castle. This marks the beginning of a tumultuous time now known as the French Revolution. In August of that year, the National Assembly drafted a Declaration of the Rights of Man, the first formal, rational approach to achieving liberté, fraternité, égalité, liberty, brotherhood, and equality, which became the motto of the French nation. In part, it reads, Les 
les représentants du peuple français constituant the representatives of the French people formed into a national assembly, considering ignorance, the lapse of memory, or contempt of the rights of man to be the sole causes of public misfortune and the corruption of governments, have resolved to set forth, in a solemn declaration, the natural, inalienable, and sacred rights of man, to the end that this declaration, constantly present to all members of the body politic, may remind them unceasingly of their rights and their duties. Article 1. Men are born and remain free in equal rights. The social distinctions can be founded only on the common utility. Article 2. The goal of any political association is the conservation of the natural and irrevocable rights of the man. These rights are freedom, property, safety, and resistance to oppression. From this chaos emerged several changes. At first, Louis XVI agreed to become a constitutional monarch, later just a plain citizen, but the stress of the situation caused him to attempt to leave the country and marshal loyalist forces against France. He was caught, sent back to Paris, tried, and sentenced to death by a vote of 300 to 299. Interestingly enough, one of the signatories on his death warrant, or in other words, one of the 300, was painter Jacques-Louis David, who had earlier accepted a commission from Louis to paint the oath of the Horati. Louis was taken to Place de la Concorde and there guillotined. A few months later, his wife Marie Antoinette was executed in the same manner. But even revolutionaries could not escape the violence. Jean-Paul Marat, a leading voice for the new government, was murdered by noble relative Charlotte Corday in vengeance for the sending of members of her extended family to the guillotine. From the blood and carnage of the revolution, a new charismatic leader emerged, Napoleon Bonaparte. Bonaparte frequently said, I am the revolution. He unified the French armies and defeated the invading forces of other royalist nations that wanted to reinstall the French monarchy for fear of losing their own royal power. Napoleon's success on the battlefield led him toward an aggressive campaign of personal aggrandizement, culminating in his moving into Versailles and crowning himself emperor hardly the sort of thing a revolutionary of the people ought to be doing. Nevertheless, Napoleon never forgot the revolutionary, logical, rational roots of the revolution, and so, even in this official portrait by Jacques-Louis David, we see next to Napoleon a scroll of law, the Code Napoléon, a set of laws which guarantee individual rights to each French citizen. This and the Declaration on the Rights of Man remain today at the center of French law and thought.